A very warm welcome to the Oxford Farming Conference Fringe Sessions. My name is Will Evans. I am one of the OFC directors. This is the third in our day-long programme of Digital Fringes. It's really important to us that we continually strive to make the conference as inclusive and as accessible as possible. Therefore, we are delighted to be able to bring this session to a global audience for free. We're all very familiar with Zoom after the last few years, but just a brief reminder, if you could keep your microphones on mute unless you are speaking. If you have any questions, please do post them in the chat. The session is being recorded and will be available via the Oxford Farming Conference website after the event. The full Fringe programme today and the conference running from the 4th to the 6th of January 2023 would not be possible without our partners and sponsors. So our huge thanks go to all of them, and in particular, to our headline sponsor, Trinity Natural Capital Group. I won't keep you any longer. Our second Fringe of the Day is hosted by Trinity AgTech. Thank you very much for your continued support of the Oxford Farming Conference, and over to you. Good morning and welcome to the Trinity Natural Capital Group Oxford Fringe Session um, and we're delighted to be this year's headline sponsor for the Oxford Farming Conference as well. My name is Anna Woodley and I'm the Director of Business Development at Trinity AgTech and I will be your chair for this morning's session on keys to securing business resilience in an uncertain era. Um, I'm delighted to be joined this morning by my colleagues on the panel who will be discussing the three pillars of sustainability and how they relate to business resiliency. And very often, um, and certainly in recent years, the term sustainability is thought of only from the perspective of environmental issues. And of course, environmental and climate focus is fundamental to our ability to continue to produce food. Um, but farmers and other industry stakeholders are running businesses which need to remain viable. They employ people, they interact with general public and so forth. And so this is where we're looking at the sustainability of farming businesses in terms of, yes, environmental, but also financial and social. And this is vital as we evolve as an industry. So this morning, we're going to hear from our three speakers, each discussing part of this whole sustainability picture and how that impacts farming and food production. So firstly, I'd like to introduce Nick Holmes. Nick is one of the partners at Chaveries, who are the leading rural accountancy firm in the southeast. And Nick is going to talk to us this morning on the topic of financial sustainability. Next, we have Craig Livingston, Head of Farming and Rural Business at the Lockley Estate in Stockbridge. And Craig and the Lockley Estate are leaders in the regenerative farming space. And Craig will be talking to us about environmental sustainability. 
And finally, I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Emily Pope, Director of Knowledge Exchange at Trinity Global Farm Pioneers, which is Trinity Group's platform for expanding conversation, learning and access to resources for the agricultural industry for all things natural capital, farming and financial. And Emily is going to talk to us about social sustainability. So the session this morning um, will work, um, we'll have a short five minute talks from each of our panel members on their respective pillar of sustainability, and then we'll come together to discuss why it's important for each of these areas of sustainability to work together for a modern farming business. We would like to encourage you to get involved this morning, so please do pop your questions into the chat box and we'll do our very best to answer as many as we can during the discussion session. Finally, before I hand over to Nick, I'd like to highlight that if you are interested in learning more about the topics that we've introduced in today's session, we will shortly be releasing a report ahead of the main Oxford Farming Conference in January. And if you'd like to order an advanced copy, please head over to trinityagtech.com and request a copy via the contact us button and we will be added to add you to the advanced list. So without further ado, um, I'm delighted to hand over to our first speaker, Nick Holmes, on the topic of financial sustainability. Nick, over to you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so for the financial pillar, you know, why is this important? When looking at this and considering what financial resilience is, uh, I mean, the first thing to say that it goes without saying no business can succeed if it isn't financially resilient. What is it? Well, it's an ability to withstand changes to your revenue and cost base, liquidity, asset base and capital structure. So it encompasses all aspects of your financial ecosystem, profit and loss account, cash flow, balance sheet. And to be resilient, you have to be able to do this consistently um and over a long period of time and you know when you look across this industry at most farming businesses you know and a number of farming businesses have been what i would describe as enduringly resilient they've lasted for a long time which is very rare in in modern commerce one of the misnomers is that resilience is just about survival but it's not just about survival, it's about being able to deliver on your street strategic plans and to take advantage of new opportunities during changing times. And, and it's critical because if you think about it, it's the only time you, you really get good opportunity is when things are volatile. So either prices are low, interest rates are high, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Financially resilient businesses thrive during changing times. The, 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 the Financial Planning and Analysis Foundation to financial resilience is absolutely critical. We work in a, you know, and live in a sector where standard costs uh, are often used to benchmark businesses, you know, and to effectively budget and forecast. But actually, they don't work in isolation. You have to have honest data. You have to ensure that the data that you're using reflects reality and reconciles across all aspects of your financial and non-financial systems. So, you, you, you have to be absolutely clear that the numbers that you are looking at are real. Accurate and timely and relevant financial planning and analysis is also critical. Um, too many businesses spend too much time looking backwards uh, and you simply can't do that because you, know, it, you can all learn from history, but actually looking forward is actually absolutely critical and if you don't do that you'll you'll stagnate and you'll never move ahead the other comment i would make is is that we also you know live in a world where metrics you know and how you actually analyze your businesses are absolutely critical going back 20 years um 
I was a financial analyst for a big telecoms business and you know we used to live by key performance indicators and it's absolutely critical that the metrics that you're using actually teach you something so EBITDA you know earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization you know understanding what your effective cash flow from the business is what your uh, debt to EBITDA ratio is separate out your land and property to truly understand what your return on capital is and be honest about what your underlying business is doing uh, stress testing and scenario planning are critical you know we all know why things are volatile build that volatility into your modeling absolutely crucial to resilience and don't be scared to plan ahead five year strategic plans in my view should be the minimum you know, annual budgets, you know, they're important, you know, to give you the detailed cash flow for the next 12 months, but actually you need a five year strategic plan to truly understand what cash is likely to look like. So how do you construct the, the pillar, you know, that, that, that pillar of resilience? Well, there's four elements that I would have. So the capital structure, so what does your debt look like? How much of the business are you funding? Your capital structure has to support the delivery of your strategic plan and you have to build in capacity. So you have to build in capacity for when things go wrong. If you're always up against it in terms of your debt, cash flow, et cetera, you will never, you know, you will never be able to ride out a storm. It just won't happen. You'll never be able to take advantage of opportunities when they come along. Um, Think about non-core assets, you know, property, et cetera, that you can get rid of if things happen um, and focus on the structure of your debt. And clearly where we're sat today, you know, where everybody thought we were going to live in a low interest rate environment forever, we're not. Um, and, and understand what your requirements for maintenance capex are over five years and beyond. Next point is financial risk management. Um, so identify the risks, you know, what is volatile, what, what's going to change. Interest rates are an obvious, you know, part of that. But so are things like level of insurance. Are you actually insured to the right level or not? Liquidity management, cash is king. Cash is absolutely king. You have to understand your cash flow cycle, particularly in a sector where, generally speaking, cash conversion is very elongated. Think about early warning um, frameworks to, 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 to build in when you have a problem. You know, you know if establishment has, is, has not worked for a crop that you're going to have a problem in six, seven, eight months time. You have to look at it in, in those ways as well. Um, and, and the last point I would say is, is, is in terms of this pillar is next. Now, next was, was Steve Jobs' business when he, he first left Apple. And, you know, the, the reality is, is that you have to think about what else you can do. Think outside the box. Financial resilience is about is also about evolving the business so that you can be resilient uh, during changing times. So in summary, your financial pillar. Next, liquidity management, financial risk management capital structure, financial planning and analysis forms that foundation. Thank you very much and back over to you, Anna. Brilliant, thank you so much, Nick. Um, so next, uh, we're going to look at the, the next pillar of sustainability, which is about environmental sustainability, um, which is something which is absolutely at, at the core of uh, business as usual at the Lockley Estate, um, as, is, as is financial sustainability. So, Craig, if you'd like to talk to us about environmental sustainability and what's going on on your farm. Thank you. Okay, will do. Thank you for inviting us to take part today. So um, I'm Craig Livingston, Head of Farming at Lockerley Estate. We're a 2000 hectare business at Lockerley Estate and Preston Farms down in Hampshire. Um, we'll move straight on. I've got five minutes and four slides. So the first question, well, one of the questions we looked at when I arrived here nearly eight years ago was, does our short term farming practice match our long term vision? And I don't think 
if I'm honest, I don't think there's many businesses um, which could truly say that their short term farming practice matches their long term vision. The, the circle on the left is a really noisy space, but it's a space that farm, farmers, farm managers, landowners uh, have to be aware of. And each of these words in there influences land use. The chessboard on the right hand side is really a is to try and avoid the kind of polarized um, or simplistic view of we can sort biodiversity by doing one thing, for example, rewilding. We can uh, pull together some soil degradation issues by doing a, another thing. But what we can't do as farmers and, and land managers is be polarized in, in our thinking. And we have to not um, make one part of that chessboard or business hectares uh, vulnerable. So we're a leaf demonstration farm, linking environment and farming, and there's lots of leaf farms up and down the country demonstrating that we can farm in harmony with the environment. The environment must not be the soft pillar. Actually, if, ever, if anything, the environmental pillar, um, yes, we can talk about the nightingales that have come back to the farm. We can talk about the arable flora, which we've brought back in by our change in practice. But actually, it brings in some real huge commercial opportunities as well. And, and looking at the, the, the sandy um, platform, uh, the, the carbon calculator and such things, there's some huge opportunities in there also. So on the left hand side is one of the farms and it's a higher tier map. Now we aren't in higher tier just because it's chasing the next free income from, from the government. We're in higher tier because we want to try and answer as many questions of that chessboard that we just talked about. Um, that takes two triple SIs and an SAC, so spare, Special Area Conservation. It's the highest derogation in Europe for biodiversity. And we're trying to link our whole business um, to perform in a certain standard. Our rotation, the top pie chart in 2015, was very simplistic, high input, average output. Change that to 2023, and we're looking at a significantly different picture. But what that rotation enables us to do is reduce nitrogen significantly, nearly 60%, 43% uh, reduction in pesticide spend. Um, we're 100% zero tillage, and that's been a process of eight years to get there. This is the first year the whole business has, has been there. Increased cover crop use. The whole business is now in cover crop. There's no bare soil or stubble on the farm. Everything is grazed. Um, imported organic fertilizers, but then that, that diversity piece as well. So it's the rooting depths and also the flowering times and everything. So it enables us to do far more. But also the higher tier piece is, is important. It's a stable income. Um, it the sustainable farm incentive. There's private funding available um, for cover crops and things through water companies. Um, the Farm and Equipment Technology Fund, which we took advantage of. So the significant opportunities for businesses to remain profitable, but do the right thing. We are doing far less and we've seen no reduction in yield. Um, we've built the system, we've thought differently and looked at a big picture. That then leads on to things that are a bit more exciting. So we then start looking at this regenerative space and however we want to call it, this different way of thinking. Um, we like regenerative farming. We know what degenerative farming looks like. So we're proud to be part of this regenerative model. And we're able to implement that zero tillage. We're looking at infiltration rates. We've bought our microscope and we've got the whole team looking at soil samples. Our Johnson Sioux bioreactor and how we can bio prime seed and all of those different things that we've integrated into the business the knock-on to the wider environment is huge, but fundamentally our commercial farming business is more resilient and it's more profitable as a result of making these changes. And then out comes the back of this, not in really nicely with Nick's point is, so even though that all of the financial reporting, all of the detail and data that Nick, accountants, bank managers, however, what they need and require, at the same time, the farming industry is going through the biggest process of change that we've probably ever been in, involved with. So plotting this in your carbon calculators, I did not want this environmental piece to be hijacked by the word carbon. But what the carbon calculator has enabled us to do is just to look at our practice. It lets you identify the biggest offenders and it lets you seek opportunities at the end of it. Our diesel use, for example, was frightening. So we made some changes to look at a different diesel alternative, which we've made, and that's got a big knock on our, on our carbon use. And the same goes with things like um, our locally loaf bread that we produce um, and sell direct to the consumer. We can carbon track that. So out the back of this is commercial opportunity on farm, um, which knots in nicely. So very passionate leaf demonstration farm. Um, we, we know we can farm in harmony with the environment and there's positive financial and environmental 
and we know social facts that come from it as well. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Craig. And I would encourage anyone, if you get the chance to go to one of Craig's uh, farm walks or open days, they're absolutely fantastic. So um, watch this space. I'm sure you'll be announcing some more soon. Um, just before we, I pass over to Emily, uh, just a reminder, do pop in your questions um, after Emily's um, talk, talk on social sustainability. We'll, we'll be having a discussion with all three panellists. So please do pop your questions into the chat. Um, Emily, handing over to you. Thank you, Anna. So I think we'd all agree that actually all three pillars, um, you know, financial, environmental, and now the social aspect of, of business resilience, all three of them are things that we can't get away from in farming and the, the social pillar is, is no different. I think as well, we'd probably all agree that there are many social pressures or social influences. We might think of them as, as influences more than pressures. Um, but there are also social opportunities as well. And those influences and opportunities exist both on farm and off farm. And actually it's recognizing in the same way with the financial and the environmental pillar that those social influences influence us as individuals, our teams, and ultimately our businesses as well. And that's happening increasingly as we think about the operating environment that, that we're working in. And, Nick's already touched on this in terms of the, the volatility in, in this operating environment. And we can expand that actually, so we can, we can think of it as a, as a VUCA environment. And you might have come across that VUCA term used before, but basically it means volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And how we navigate through that VUCA environment is really part of the theme of the report that, that we're publishing that Anna has already mentioned. But back to today, um, just move my slide on, brilliant, thank you. Um, we've already had you know, some, some really real and impactful examples from Ukraine from the first speaker this morning about some of the influences um, on farm and, and off farm. Um, and actually when I was listening to that presentation, I was reflecting back on, on my presentation that I've prepared for today and actually these kind of pale into insignificance in, in some respects, but they are still relevant. And I think it's still um, important that we look at them and, and look at how we deal with them as businesses. So if we start with the on-farm influences or pressure, probably labor is the most obvious one that we might think of. Uh, and that could be anything from recruiting and retaining a diverse workforce. It could be access to labor. If you're in a management position, you're going to have responsibilities for training and mentoring. We all have responsibilities, whether we're in a management position or part of a team, for looking after the physical and mental health of our staff and, and the people around us. And whether we work as a team of two or, or a larger team, we probably all work as a team. And, and with that comes some of those social influences, the dynamics of working with other people can sometimes be extremely complex. And especially in agriculture, when we're thinking of farm businesses, when you're working maybe with, with family members as well, that can sometimes be quite complex to navigate. As well as, uh, as labor, we can think about the type of farming systems that we implement in our farm businesses. And you might think, well, how is that, you know, how is that linked to, to social influences or, or social sustainability? But ultimately, what we do on our farm is influenced by, you know, what people want to eat, what people want to see in the environment, what, what we want to do on our farms. So ultimately, the, the different types of farming systems that we implement, so that could be, you know, different cultivation systems, regenerative agriculture, organic systems, that impacts on the type of machinery that we have. So actually, you might think, okay, what's the link between machinery and social influence? But that, that social pillar, that social influence does affect so much of our, of our farm businesses. So in, you know, in that, it is so integral to building a resilient farm business as well. And the same can be said for technology. The systems that we implement uh, mean that certain tools and technology are less or more available to us and less or more useful to us as well, depending on, on what system we're using. And obviously we can't ignore the role of policy and markets on farm as well, driving our decision making. So it might feel sometimes that there are many influences that we can't control and some of them might never even make it onto farm. 
um, and consumers might be a good example here. So we're all aware of changes in consumers' diets, preferences for different foods, different food groups, and increasingly becoming aware of people's either accessibility or their, their ability to, you know, they, they can't access nutritious and healthy food. And ultimately that does have an impact on, on agricultural production because we have an influence on that and, and those kind of dynamics have an influence on us. So if we really want to understand these different influences, uh, these opportunities, some people, you know, we could say they're challenges, but let's be positively optimistic as, as was uh, introduced to us at the start of the conference. Uh, think about these opportunities. It's sometimes really hard to know where to start because as I said, you might feel like these, these are things that you can't control. It can feel very abstract. You can't put your finger on it. It's not like you can see it on a financial statement, on a bank statement or in a, in a written report. It's not like, you know, with some of the environmental things, you can't go out into the field and, and physically see it in the field, like an you know, environmental stewardship or a flowering strip, for example. So it can be really abstract and it can be quite difficult um, to, yeah, to, to get a handle of. And actually, you know, I often say to people, you know, our industry is, is all about people. It is about farming, but it is all about people because you couldn't farm without people because you wouldn't farm if, you know, if we weren't here to be fed. Um, so actually starting with people and ultimately starting with ourselves can be quite uh, uncomfortable and probably isn't something that as, as an industry we're that used to doing. But it is really important because if we have a better understanding of ourselves, then we're going to have a better understanding of how we respond to change. So some of these, you know, financial um, you know, the strategic planning that Nick's talked about, some of the environmental opportunities, you know, becoming a leaf demonstration farmer that Craig's talked about. There are certain drivers, there are certain reasons why different people respond to these different opportunities and, and actually go ahead and do the strategic planning or, you know, push themselves and, and become a leaf demonstration farmer, for example. So really only by understanding ourselves and, and how we think and respond to, to these opportunities um, can we actually capitalise on them. And it might be that we've got some preconceived ideas. So, you know, a new market comes along, for example, and we might be really hesitant to it because maybe we've got some preconceived ideas. Maybe we're very risk averse and we're sat here thinking, OK, well, I'm just going to wait to see what other people do. I'm not going to jump straight in. I'm just going to manage the risk associated with this. So it really is about understanding ourselves. And that is really key to building that resilient business, because Without knowing that, we're never going to implement the financial things that Nick's talked about, and we're never going to implement the environmental things that Craig has mentioned. So we don't have any control over, you know, other people, you know, these other off-farm and on-farm pressures, but we can get to know ourselves better. And as I said, it's not, it's not um, the most sometimes comfortable thing to do or the most easy thing to do either. So the next couple of slides are just going to take us through maybe some of the things that we could start thinking about within ourselves to understand why we respond to different things in different ways and the first place to start is to better know our internal factors so you can see there's a number of them on the screen here i'm not going to go into all of them in detail because we haven't got time but they they each drive how we how we behave and how we respond to different opportunities so if I start with attitude, if we have a, if we have a positive attitude about something, so a new opportunity comes along or, you know, Nick's mentioned strategic planning, financial planning. If I have a positive attitude about that, then I'm more likely to do it. And I'm more likely to do it if, if I have that positive attitude, not just because of the advantages and disadvantages like Nick has outlined, but because I believe that there is a value that I attach to that. So it's the right thing to do. It's a good thing to do. Therefore, I'm more likely to do it. And an example could be, um, you know, I can go and as a farmer, I can plant the flower strips, I can potentially reduce my pesticide usage. Um, you know, the advantages and disadvantages of that are, well, the advantages are I'm promoting my natural enemy control, I might save some money from reducing my pesticide input. Maybe the disadvantages that I'm aware of are, you know, it's a very, very knowledge intensive system using integrated pest management in that way. I need to know how the pest behaves and how the predators behave so I know the advantages and disadvantages but I do it because I think it's the right thing to do and it's a good thing for biodiversity for example so that's my attitude towards that practice and my perception of risk comes into play here so you know I know the advantages and the disadvantages but I still go ahead and do it 
And it's that kind of motivation when we when we've got a new challenge or opportunity that really sticks because it's permanent. So it's something that's inherent within me um, or within you. And it's not based on an external reward, like a financial reward for doing something. And it's that kind of motivation that actually builds resilience, because I believe something's good in that example but then something else might happen in a year's time. And if I think it's the right thing to do, then I'm more likely to do it. We can think about our social environment as well. Um, ultimately, we do things because other people around us are doing them as well. So we have a tendency as, as a human species to conform to norms. And we do things that other people think are good as well. So we might do things that we think are good, but that's influenced by what other people think are good. So I think it's always a good opportunity to almost like I, I do it just looking at who do I follow on Twitter? You know, we have this tendency to surround ourselves by people that reinforce our own ideas and we reinforce their ideas. So if you're thinking of adopting a new practice, if you're thinking of, you know, building that more resilient business, do you need to maybe look outside of your initial circle, maybe connect with, with someone who thinks about things in a completely different way? You might completely disagree with them, but actually it you know it challenges the way that you're thinking it challenges those norms that we have that ten tendency to conform to and if we think about what will stop us adapting resistance is is probably a really key one and that comes when we feel that our freedom of choice is taken away from us or undermined or that we feel controlled in a situation and we can think of you know some policy implications um you know rules and regulations that are imposed on on farming um, that can sometimes result in us feeling resistant to change as individuals again not just within farming but just generally we want autonomy and when we don't have that autonomy we can become very skeptical and we fight back so we either fight back and we you know not doing that or we stick our heads in the sand and we just you know almost like ignore it and pretend it's not happening but ultimately we don't we don't bounce back sometimes we don't change we don't adapt we don't build that resiliency so it is really hard to think and challenge ourselves in, in this way. And it's certainly a skill to build. It's not it's not as you know fun or nice as, as going out and doing something in the field, maybe. But it is really worthwhile in terms of building that into your business structure for you as an individual, but also with the team that you're working with. So I think we all agree, you know, between the three pillars and, and probably everyone on the call as well, that building a resilient business is, is really that ability to change and adapt to new opportunities because we never know what's around the corner. And another way that we can look at it, say, you know, you're faced with a new opportunity or challenge is to, to sit down and consider it using what we call the reset model. So you can see that here, those five circles along the bottom rules, education, social pressure, economic incentive and tools. And this way of thinking was introduced to me by Dr. Yolanda Janssen, who's an amazing researcher, consultant and communicator on, on this whole topic. And she's actually going to be joining us at Oxford in January um, for, for our session at the in-person event. But all of these come together to, to change our behaviour. And you can see that some of them are compulsory. So rules, we've talked about how that can create resistance and voluntary and the two internally motivated ones are social pressure and education or social influence that social environment and and education and though that that combination of those two really drives that change in behavior that comes from within so it's more permanent it means that we're more likely to adapt to change in the future whatever that change might be and we, we don't know what it is and that combination of education and social um environment is something that's very much at the heart of Trinity Global Farm Pioneers. So I think in summary, it can feel like a very alien subject to many of us. And it certainly was to me when I first started working in this space. It can be the hardest one for us to get our heads around because as I say, you can't really see it, you can't, you can't touch it. But in many ways you can, and then it's the easiest to see because it really starts with us looking in the mirror at ourselves to better understand ourselves. So thank you, Anna, I'll hand back over to you. Brilliant, thank you all uh, so much for, for introducing us um, to those three pillars of sustainability. And we really do think that um, as we look at how the industry um, is, is evolving and needs to evolve, that it's really important for us all to 
really take a good look at, at the component parts of those and, and think about it in the round. So we're going to open up now for um, a bit of a discussion and to answer some of the questions. Um, there are a few questions that have come in on the chat. Please do continue to add your questions in and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so if you'd all three of you like to, to come off um, mute um, and we'll have a little bit of a discussion on, on what we've learned this morning. Um, I'm going to just start off reminding us of the theme of this year's Oxford Farming Conference, which is Farming a New Future. Um, and Emily said right at the beginning of the Fringe session today um, about um, our need for being um, you know, really optimistic about the future of farming and, and the future of food production. Um, but I think it's fair to say that obviously farming uh, you know, has to pay um, and economic drivers are really important to that. Um, and there isn't always a way to adopt new approaches. So um, I guess our first question this morning um, to the panel is how can farmers do the right thing if um, it doesn't necessarily um, or obviously stack up financially? And um, Nick, I'm going to come to you first, if that's OK. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Um, I mean, always a difficult uh, discussion to have with someone if if you know, thing, things aren't working and the, the, the numbers don't work. But in in most cases, if people are willing to change and evolve, you can make things work. But the, the, the you know, one of the biggest issues I think that we've had as a, as a sector is that, you know, it's always been quite black and white in terms of what what people can do and you know what's available and you know people have always you know done an annual budget and then panicked and you know done that budget halfway through the year which is why it's so critical that people employ you know medium to long-term strategic plans take a long hard look at their businesses um look outside the box look at you know what they you know what they can do beyond um, you know what they're already doing because in, in most cases there's always a way of evolving a business into something that is uh, sustainable in in all aspects mm. And, and Craig, you know, you adopted what may look on paper as some fairly radical decisions on your farm, um, you know, going back sort of 10 years ago now, you know, how did you deal with that kind of um, vision that, you know, things had to change, things had to evolve, and balancing that with this sort of um, desire to be sustainable, but also, you know, you're running a big business, you employ people, you have um, community aspects, being that Lockley is a fairly substantial sized estate. How did you go through that kind of mindset change and, and thinking about that? So this um, was not just about me, this was very much led by the whole team, um, the way we wanted to farm. Um, our landowners, um, have enabled us hugely and I think landowners often don't get some of the credit they deserve if you've got the, the right landowner um, or landlord whatever it is that that promote and enable this to go to this change of thinking then um, it can be impactive but that said there's no free meal for anybody this had to pay for itself every building there was a return on capital every change of use so fundamentally what are our income streams um, what pays and what doesn't um, how did if each enterprise pay for their hectare? You know, unfortunately, pre um, pre Ukraine Russia situation, um, the fourth best thing we could do on our business was plant an arable crop from our net margin per hectare. So we looked at different renewable energy um, and higher tier schemes and other things. Um, so we we can't do the green in the red, as we often say. Um, and farming is not a charity. Farming is a business and it must pay for itself, but it absolutely has a, a social responsibility to do the right thing. And it can do the right thing. Some of the policy decisions need to catch up some of the stacking of incomes. Um, we, we really need to have some of these incomes stacked. We shouldn't be have uh, incomes in isolation, um, but that's uh, a slightly different topic. Mm. Emily, um, you, know, you talk about um, you know, mindset change and um, working together community. I know that's really at the heart of, of what you do over at Pioneers. 
trust obviously plays a, a massive part in decisions on farm and you know there is a requirement for us to look potentially outside of our own farming businesses to others in the sector you know how does the farmer start to build trust what you know what should they be looking for what what's involved within the the, the thought process I guess around making those decisions and where one should place their trust that's yeah it's a really good question Anna I think um I think you you know, you've got lots of opportunities in the industry to connect with maybe with other farmers who are maybe further down the journey of whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. And, you know, speaking to them, going and visiting them, seeing what they're doing, you know, seeing is believing. I think that's quite a, a, a powerful thing that that builds trust. And, you know, and if they have integrity in terms of what they're doing and why they're doing it, and you can, you know, you can go and see it in in the real, and think, yeah, that that demonstrating that that it is achievable is something that is really supportive for people, mm. and and building that building that community and and that network of of like minded people um, to to support you on on your journey. I think. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't be challenged and you can't challenge each other as well it's not that you always have to agree with one another um, you can still trust somebody even if you've got um, you know slightly differences of opinion um, mm. but yeah I think it's for me it's just all about that communication um, and and just yeah getting getting to know other people and, and their businesses mm. Emily, staying with you, we've had a mm. question come in um, from Mads Fisher-Muller. Thank you, Mads. Um, Emily, how much are farmers aware of changes in diets and future food market possibilities? And could more be done to prepare farmers for new market opportunities, for example, the surging market for plant forward diets? To your thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, again, a very good question. I think it'd be It'd probably be an interesting one to ask everyone on the call, actually, in terms of where where they think the future trends are going. There is obviously a lot of work that's done um, around consumer behaviour and and why consumer behaviour is is changing and how it's changing and how it's predicted to change in the future. Um, and and that information is available. Whether that's something that people are building into their farm businesses, I'd, I'd probably actually ask Craig to maybe comment on that in a bit more detail. Um, Craig, is that something that you build into your farm business? Yeah, so interesting. We, so I was on the panel for National Food Strategy, and this is this came up significantly. And I think Henry Dinwiddie dealt with it really nicely. There was the space for robotics, hydroponics, vertical farming, insect. You know, um, there is space for all of that. But he had the big question of what about the rest? And the rest was regenerative agriculture. Um, you know, the rest is a significant proportion. So uh, we're fully aware of changing diets, but how close is a farmer to the consumer? That's the biggest question. Often the farmer is held apart from the consumer and it's the set, some of the same businesses that put into the, the industry that then take back out of the industry. So we have this, this quiet, gentle disruption of trying our best to reconnect with the consumer at Lockerley, and I know several other farming businesses are trying that as well. So, Brilliant. Um, we've got time for one more question. There are several questions that's, that have come through on the chat. Um, so we will take those questions offline, um, pull some answers together and, and share those um, back out after the Fringe event for those we haven't managed to get to. Um, but just we've got time for one last question. Um, and I'm going to go with um, Nick. Do you think that there are any significant stranded assets within the farming and food supply chain that we should be aware of? And what can we do about those as an industry? A uh, simple answer is yes. I mean, the starting point for, for any business is, to, and, and I think Craig's touched on this, is you, you have to understand what your asset base is, mm. what it's worth and what return you're getting on it. And the reality is, is that as, as an industry, you know, there's a, re there's a real estate part to it and there's a trading part to it, effectively. They're, they're two separate things. And, and people never separate them because everyone says, oh, you never get a decent return on capital on land. Well, but, you know, it's actually the, the return you're getting on that land, if you accept it's a land asset, which maybe is only going to be one or two percent. But but what return can you get actually on the farming of that land? And and, and they are two distinct, different things. And and. 
all businesses should analyze their their balance sheet and their asset base and really understand what they've got and if they do that then stranded assets will either you know be you know be, be sold or or they need to evolve and it, it, it's it's as simple as that but but few few businesses do that and all, all businesses should do that mm, really interesting so we just in the final minute, um, if I could just ask for our, our final slide just to be popped up on the screen. Um, I'd like to, to thank you, um, Nick Craig and Emily, so much for, for joining us this morning for our fringe session. Um, I'd just like to, to take the last minute to, to re-highlight to everyone that if you are interested in learning more about the topics that we've discussed today, um, our report um, on this will be launched within the next couple of weeks. Um, and if you'd like to receive a copy, please do um, get in touch via the Trinity Ag Tech website. Um, we go into case studies um, looking at different farming businesses and how they're being becoming more resilient in a changing era. Finally, uh, we really look forward to seeing many of you at the Oxford Farming Conference in January, um, where we will be hosting um, another session with Yolanda um, Janssen, who's a leading thought, a thought leader in this space on mindset agriculture's next revolution. Thank you so much. We'll back over to you. I'm sure you will all agree that was an absolutely fascinating session and left us all with plenty of food for thought as we count down to the conference in January, Farming and New Future. A big, big thanks to Trinity Ag Tech for your time today and to all of you at home for joining us. Just a reminder, the session was recorded uh, and will be available to watch back on demand in the next few days. And if you would like to join us in January, and um, please do, we'd love to see you there. Tickets to attend in person or online are still on sale at ofc.org.uk. Our next fringe, Roots to Farming, Attracting and Growing Future Talent, really important topic in agriculture, is hosted by McDonald's UK and Ireland and will start at 1pm. So you've all got time to go and get yourself some lunch now. You'll need to click on a different Zoom link, which you can now find in the chat or in any of your confirmation emails. Thank you.